Hello, I'm Ray T. In this video, I'll be presenting my paper, Cash Versus Key Dependency. I worked on this with Daniel Jenkin, Romain Posier, Yuval Yarom, and Yanjing Zhao. Ciphers can be vulnerable against cash attacks. We recover secret information if we know the internal structure of the cipher and if we know the victim's cash access. In a paper, we show that secret key dependent transformations do not guarantee additional protection against cash attacks. We'll be looking at the encryption algorithm POSANG, which is part of the North Korean Red Star OS 3.0. It was leaked a few years ago, and Crypto's logic has reverse engineered its code. It's what we've used to test our attack on. POSANG is based on the AES cipher, with the main differences of having key dependent S boxes and key dependent shift row permutations. With AES, secret information can be recovered with cache attacks, and also because we know the internal structure of AES. In the paper, we find that secret transformations do not make POSANG more secure against cache attacks that are used for AES. So for the remainder of this video, I would first like to start off with a refresher on AES, then introduce a cache attack that we can use for AES, and then go into how that can be adapted for POSANG. AES is a cipher that encrypts messages over a number of rounds of transformation. In this slide, we will just look at one of those rounds. We start off with our initial state, S0, with the message that we want to encrypt, also known as the plain text P. I've represented the AES state here as a 4 by 4 matrix, with each element representing a byte of information. We XOR the plain text with the first round key. The round keys are generated from a master key that is, is expanded to a number of round keys. After the add round key stage, each byte is substituted by looking at a lookup table or a substitution box. We then apply the shift row operation to the state. Looking at the colors here, we can see that the shift row cyclically shifts each row by some amount. We then apply mixed columns. Mixed columns essentially replaces each byte with a function of itself and the other bytes in the column. This is the last round of this is the last transformation of this round. The output of mixed columns is then used as the input for the next round, and this repeats for a number of times for AES to encrypt the message. Let's look at attacking AES. We have our input the plain text, and then we XOR it with the key. This is used to index the lookup table or the substitution box. From now on, I'll be referring to it as SBox. And here, I've represented it as SB. And it, and it is indexed with the previous state, plain text XOR key. Thing to note here is that because the index is equal to plain text XOR key, we can say that the key is equal to the index XOR key, plain text. If we know the plain text, and if we can somehow get the index, we can get the key. We can get the index by using cache attacks. We obtain SBox accesses by observing memory accesses to the cache. We use Prime and Probe, which uses timing information to infer victims' cache accesses over a period of time. Let's look at this in practice. We have our initial state, the plain text. Now, say if we perform multiple encryptions with different plain texts, but here we fix one of the plain text byte. Then we perform the add round key stage, and we notice that across the encryption, that byte's value is still fixed, but to a different value this time, plain text XOR key. Note that that fixes the SBox access. And we can observe this SBox access in memory. And we can get the, and since we know the plain text, and now we have the index, we can get the key. In reality, cache attacks on AES isn't as simple as that. There are some practical challenges that we will first have to address. One of this is the limited temporal resolution. With Prime and Probe, we sample the cache at regular intervals. That means that there are many accesses that happen between samples, some of which we don't care about, and that creates noise. To help illustrate this, I've come up with a representation of the cache. Each region represents a cache line, and the dark regions represent that that cache line has been accessed. So with this first one, we perform a Prime and Probe over an encryption and we fix one of the plain text, so we expect that one of these regions represent the SBox access. Now we perform prime and probe over an encryption again, and we notice a different cache access patterns. 
We do this over a number of times. What we can do is average over these results. What we will see is there is one re region that is the darkest. That means that that cache line has been consistently accessed over the different encryption. And because we know that when we fix that one plain text byte, it will fix the plain the bytes Xbox access in the first round. And so that dark region should correspond with the first round Xbox access. So we found the index, and we've also got the plain text, and we have the key. There is another challenge that we have to resolve. That is limited spatial resolution. We can't distinguish between accesses to the same cache line. For AES, we have multiple Xbox entries that are present in the same cache line. With the 256 Xbox, in this case, they are mapped to four different cache lines, with each cache line storing 64 of the Xbox entries. That means that we can only see the Xbox accesses to the resolution of the cache line. So if the first part, if the first cache line was accessed, we know that the first six, one of the first 64 entries were accessed, but we don't know which one. Same goes for the next one. That means if we perform the attack as we have just before, we can only recover partial information about the key. Here we can only recover two to four bits of each key byte. So the solution is to perform the attack in two rounds. The first round being what we've just seen, and the second round is to look at more Xbox accesses in the second round to get more information and recover the remaining bits of each key byte. Let's look at the cache attack on AES in more detail. Here we have the first round attack, and we fix the Xbox access for this byte, which we observe in memory. When we perform the different encryptions, we also perform prime and probe to observe the cache accesses during the encryption. And we see that there is one cache line that is consistently accessed throughout the encryption, and that represents the Xbox access. And we know that that's, part of the, that's one part of the Xbox. And we've got some info, now we've got some information on the index, and we've got the plain text, so we can recover only some information of key, in this case, two to four bits. Now we have to perform another part to the attack to re recover the remaining bits. For this next part, we will be looking at the second round Xbox accesses. Note that for the first round, we fix the first byte so that we fix the first round Xbox access. So for the second round, we need to fix the second round Xbox accesses. The problem with that is that the input to the second round is the output of the first round. And we will see how we can fix the output to the first round in the next slide. The second round attack, we have the plain text again. Now we have different encryptions, and this time we fix four bytes, and we fix the four bytes across the diagonal of the matrix. We perform add round key and sub bytes and shift rows. And what we know is that the fixed bytes are mapped to the same column this time. Now when we perform mixed columns, those bytes in the column will be fixed across the encryption. So we have four state bytes fixed at the end of the first round. And we use that as the input to the next round. And when we perform add round key, we find that those Xbox accesses are fixed as well. The idea for the second round attack is to fix four plain text bytes that map to the same column after shift rows. We need to know the transformation to know which four plain text bytes to fix so that they will map to the same column after shift rows. Luckily for AES, we know the shift row transformation, so we know which plain text bytes to fix. But for Pilsang, the shift row permutation is key dependent. So this attack will be a little bit more tricky. So that's a brief description of the cache attack on AES. Now let's look at how that can be adapted for Pulsang. Let's first look at how Pulsang differs from AES. Pulsang is based on AES with key-dependent transformations. Pulsang has a slightly different key schedule. The master key is passed through a SHA-1 base function to generate K. Pulsang uses the AES key schedule with K to generate 11 round keys. Pulsang's S boxes is slightly different as well. There are different S boxes that are used for each state byte at each round. So at each round, there will be 16 different S boxes. 
and the S boxes depend on the corresponding key byte of the next round. Here is a visualization of the S box accesses for AES in one of the rounds. We have the state XO of the key, and during sub bytes, they all access the same S box. Now with Posang, we see that each byte accesses a different S box. Posang also has a different shift row. Posang shift row uses a pseudo random permutation. The permutations depend on the key of the next round, and from there, it generates some permutation to shuffle the state. Here we have a representation of the AES shift rows. AES shift rows simply shifts each row by some amount. With Pusang, we get the next round key to generate a pseudo random permutation to shuffle the state around. Now let's look at the first round attack on Pusang. It is exactly like we would do it for AES. For Pusang, we get the two most significant bits of each key byte, and we use the cache access pens to infer S box access indices. And from here, we can reduce the search space for the second round attack. In this slide, we'll look at some experimental results for the first round attack. Here we have the heat map that represents the cache accesses when the byte is fixed. On the x axis is the cache set, on the y axis is the plain text value that the byte has been fixed to. The darker the regions represent the that the cache set has been accessed. Here's a visual representation of the byte's S box. The byte, the S box is mapped contiguously across the cache set. So the first 64 goes to the leftmost cache set, and then next 64 goes to the second left, and so on. Now, if we look at the first 64 S box entries, they're accessed when the byte's plain the bytes plain text are set to 64 to 127. Now, if we just look at the two most significant bits, the S box entries, two most significant bits are 0, 0, and the byte plain text, two most significant bits are 0, 1. We can use that to get K with plain text XOR index, and we find that the keys bytes, two most significant bits are 0, 1. Now, when we look at the other region of the S box, where the entries are 64 to 127, that occurs when the plain text is set to 0 to 63. Again, we step through the same process, and we find that the key bytes two most significant bits are 0, 1. And we can do the same for the other regions, and we find that the results are consistent. Now, before moving on to the second round attack, recall that the second round attack requires us to fix four bytes that map to the same column after shift throws. But because shift rows in Pusang is key dependent, we don't know the permutation. So we will have to reverse shift rows. There are two steps to reversing shift row. One is to do a column mapping. We, by observing cache accesses, we can find a group of four bytes that map to the same column in shift row. We can also identify which column the group maps to. Here we see an example of a possible shift row permutation and we find that these four bytes map to those columns. Mix, we can find column ordering. After finding the bytes that map to the same column, we can find which row each byte goes to. So for example, with the first column, after finding the row each byte goes to, we would have found where the byte maps to after shift row. And we can do so for the remaining columns and we have completely reversed shift rows. Looking at the column mapping in more detail, the idea here is to fix four bytes and then check if they map to the same column after shift rows. If they do, then we have found the correct four bytes. An example here where we take multiple encryptions and we fix these four bytes and we find that after shift rows, they don't map to the same column. So after mixed columns, Across all the encryptions, we won't see any fixed bytes. We can do the same again, fixing four other bytes, and they map to the same column after shift rows. And when we, when we apply mixed columns, those values will be fixed. We can observe this because fixing four bytes that map to the same column in shift row 
to fix the Xbox accesses at the second round. Let's look at an experimental result for the wrong guess. Here is the normalized probe time. On the x-axis is the cache set. The peaks represent that the cache set has been accessed. With the wrong guess, we see four peaks. These four peaks represent the first round S-box accesses to the four fixed plain text bytes. And there's nothing more to see here. Now let's look at the correct guess. We have fixed the columns after mixed columns, and that propagates to fixing the second round S-box accesses. When we look at the normalized probe time here, we see eight different peaks. These four peaks are the first round S-box accesses of the four fixed plain text bytes. We know that because we have already performed the first round attack. The remaining four peaks are the second round S-box accesses. And because we've performed the first round attack, we know that this region of the cache set corresponds to the first column of bytes. Now we've done column mapping, we can look into column ordering. We have to understand mixed columns a little bit more first. Mixed columns is the matrix multiplication. Now let's focus just on one of those columns. Say we fix all the bytes except for one. That means that that column, the elements of those columns can be expressed as the varying bytes value. So fixing three bytes in a column and varying the other results in a predictable behavior dependent on the varying byte. Where that byte is in the column will result in a different set of equations that represents the elements in the column. And we observe that by looking at the cache access patterns. So by looking at the second round S-box accesses, we can determine which equations they are and therefore determine the location of that byte in the column. Let's look at an experimental result of this. We have fixed these four bytes and varied the, the first byte. After shift row, we are not sure where that varying byte is in the column, but we observe the second round S-box accesses. Here with the cache sheet map, we know where the first round S-boxes are, and we don't care about that. This region is the second round S-box accesses. We see that for the different plain text value of that varying byte, we have a different second round S-box access patterns. This is different because of the varying byte. Now we can look at this in more detail in this region. This region shows the four second round S-box accesses. What we need to know here is that by fixing three of the bytes and varying the other, there will always be two second round S-box accesses that are identical up to XOR with a constant. Identifying them will give us the role of the varying plain text byte. So for example, with this one, accesses in the first and second S boxes are identical up to XOR with constant one zero. So when we look at plain text zero, the two most significant bits of the first S box is one one, and the two most significant bits of the second S box is zero one. When we XOR them, we get one zero. And we can do that for the other plain text values, and we'll find that they are all identical up to XOR with constant 1, 0. And because they are the first and second S boxes, we know that the varying byte is in the last row of column. So, so far, we've performed the first round attack and we've gotten two most significant bits of the first round key. We prepared the second round attack by reversing the first round of the key dependent transformation shift rows. Now let's look at performing the second round attack. Here I've got the visual representation after shift rows of the first round. We found that the byte is in the last row of the column. Note that for that byte, the second round S-box access can be expressed as the following expression. We have SB1 representing the second round S-box access and SB0 as the first round S-box access. What we need to note here is that the index to the second round S-box, we can observe this in the cache. Now, if we can calculate this purple region, we can see that it will match what we observe in the cache up to a constant. But to calculate this, we have to get the first round S-box value. And that is dependent on the next round key. 
RK1. We don't know RK1, but we can guess RK1 and then calculate what the first round S box value would be. So now we can calculate this purple region. We guess RK0 and RK1 and then calculate this value. If we guess the correct key, this will match what we observe in the cache up to a constant. So for the second round attack, for each key byte, we guess six unknown bits of the first round key and eight bits of the second round key. There's a total of two to the 14 possible guesses to test for each key byte. And on average, observing Xbox accesses for around 30 different plain text byte values for each key byte is sufficient. To summarize, Hillsung's secret dependent transformation can be reversed by observing cache accesses. To fully break the cipher, we perform around 35 million encryptions and around 19,500 queries of Xbox accesses. On average, it takes about 8 minutes to run on a typical laptop. And we showed that constant time implementation is needed as a defense for side channel attacks.